Well, again, welcome here to West Point Community Church. My name is Pastor Jared, and it is just a blessing to see everyone here, opportunity to get out of the, the heat and enjoy some air conditioning. So uh, we, we have a hot week coming up, and uh, trust that the week will go well with our VBS. Looking forward to that. And uh, is there any kids here going to VBS? Any kids going to VBS? Awesome. Well, I hope you guys have a great time. I'm going to be there too, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, before we get into the message, uh, I first of all want to bring you greetings from the Evangelical Mennonite Conference National Staff. Uh, our family and many other families, several other families from West Point attended our EMC Festival. It was up in the Crete this past weekend, and it was a great time of fellowship and encouragement. Uh, our conference pastor, Andy Woodworth, gave a State of the Church address on Friday at our ministerial meeting, and our own Pastor Waldy led a session on discipleship on that Friday as well. Uh, just had a great time uh, just interacting and, and hearing content, and uh, we had some table discussion during those times as well. Uh, I think a couple highlights for me was hearing Phil Calloway. Uh, as our main speaker on Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. If you're familiar with Phil Calloway, he is a Christian author and speaker and uh, just did a really good job. Uh, he, he had us laughing. He had us crying, uh, often within seconds, how they, the good communicators are able to do that. And he just wanted to remind us again of the incredible gift that is ours in Christ, our salvation. A couple other highlights. Uh, one was the food. Always, uh, uh, always good to uh, enjoy some good Mennonite cooking up in La Crete. Uh, another highlight was that Richard Cron here, our moderator, and, and I were able to lead a workshop together on how to navigate hot topics in the church. So that was hopefully relevant and uh, helpful. It was enjoyable to do that. And then Corny and Evangeline from our church were there as well. They had opportunity to highlight the ministry of Joy Chapel, and they led a workshop highlighting that ministry as well. And so again, it was a great event. If you didn't know, you were invited. Uh, all of the EMC churches uh, were invited up to the Crete this past weekend. And so stay tuned for the next one that will come up maybe next summer or after that. Well, we will transition now to the message this morning, and we have about a month left in our series through the book of Acts. We've been working our way through since the fall, and our series title is Christ Enthroned and the Church Empowered. This title reminds us of the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. He is now seated at the right hand of God. He is enthroned with all power and dominion, and he is empowering the church with his spirit. And so I wouldn't mind if you would just kind of go back all the way to the beginning in Acts uh, chapter 2. Uh, you'll see that Peter is speaking, and he says this in verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, speaking of Christ, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And so again, Peter is, these are his words. He is responding to every Jew, to Jews from every nation under heaven, pardon me, Acts 2 verse 5, and addressing the events of Pentecost when the Spirit descended upon all those who were waiting with the disciples in Jerusalem, Acts 2 verse 3. And so everything that is recorded in the rest of this letter in the book of Acts is an outflow of the plans and purposes of God through the pouring out of the Spirit among those who placed their faith and trust in Jesus as the Messiah who died and rose again, defeating sin and death and the power of Satan. Christ is enthroned and the church is empowered. Now, if you go back even earlier in Acts 1.8, 
We have our very own table of contents for the book of Acts, directly from the words of Jesus, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we've talked about this before, but this is, this is the ripple effect where the gospel, the, the Holy Spirit comes at Jerusalem and then out works its way out, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. <clears throat> now, fast forward several months, and we are now <clears throat> following along with Paul's journey. He has had his missionary journeys out. He has shared the truth of Christ. And now he has arrived back in Jerusalem, only to be targeted as a troublemaker and traitor, by the Jewish establishment, and then brought into custody by the Roman authorities, both for Paul's protection and for further understanding on why the Jews were so upset with this man. And so we are in Acts chapter 26, so you can turn there. And what we find is that the Apostle Paul, in a roundabout way, is punching his ticket to Rome which would represent the end of the earth in our Acts 1-8 table of contents. It was probably not the way that Paul had imagined that he would travel to Rome, that being chained and in custody, but nevertheless, God's redemptive plans and purposes were being fulfilled in and through the decisions of men like Felix and Festus and King Agrippa. These are some of the governors and kings that have been dealing with Paul while he was in custody. And so that brings us to where we are in Acts chapter 26. Paul is standing before King Agrippa and is invited to share his defense. And so I would ask that you would stand for the reading of God's word and I will read Acts chapter 26. <clears throat> so Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews." They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that, I co that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here <clears throat> on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O King." Why is it thought <clears throat> incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I'm, <clears throat> I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, 
delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So we have a wonderful testimony and defense of the Apostle Paul in chapter 26. Now before we work through this passage, I would like us to be reminded of the words of our Savior that he shared to his disciples, and that is in Matthew 10, 16 to 20. Jesus said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep, In the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour." For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So this is what Jesus said to his disciples. And now consider, in light of what we've just read in Matthew's Gospel, what Jesus said to his disciples, consider now the Apostle Paul. He has been delivered over. He has been flogged and beaten and brought before governors and kings. And so our passage this morning is exactly what Jesus had forementioned to his disciples. Paul is here in Acts 26 before a governor and a king, and he, excuse me, and he must be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. He is to remain calm and collected, knowing that the Spirit of God will give him the words to share. And so that is exactly what we see from Paul in this interaction. Uh, Let's be reminded of the context of, of this defense of Paul. In Acts 25, we read that King Agrippa arrived with Bernice to Caesarea with great pomp. We see this in verse 23. Entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and with prominent men of the city. And so this is a formal setting. There is 
<clears throat> dignity here. Uh, there's order. Um, there are none of Paul's accusers are there to to heckle him or cause a disruption, other than Festus, who we we read he pipes up there at the end of Paul's defense. Now Festus is there because he is wanting advice from Agrippa, because Festus is required to write down an accusation against Paul, and then that accusation in writing would travel with Paul to inform Caesar of why he was being sent to him. We see this in Acts 25, beginning in verse 26. This is Festus speaking. Thank you. I don't know why I seem to find the frogs every Sunday. Acts 25, beginning in verse 26, Festus speaking with Agrippa. But I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. And so you can see that Festus wants clarity. He is at a loss as to what to write with regard to the charges against Paul. So far, Paul has stood before other councils and given defenses, and none of the accusations have stuck. And so Festus is feeling a little bit of tension here because he knows that Paul's going to be sent off, and what is the accusation that will go with him? And so we come to our passage, we see that Agrippa takes charge of the meeting, invites Paul to speak, Paul begins by thanking Agrippa for the opportunity to share, and then reminds all that Agrippa is well aware of the customs and controversies of the Jews. You see that in 26 verse 3. Now he says this because Agrippa is a Jew and therefore would be familiar with Judaism and its customs and even some of the differences of, of, of understandings and teachings between the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so as we see in this chapter, the majority uh, of it, verses 4 to 23, is Paul's defense. Then he is interrupted by Festus and makes some closing remarks. And so in looking at Paul's defense uh, before us, um, what we have is a masterful example of someone trusting in the power of the Spirit to speak clearly of the ramifications of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had told his disciples not to worry what to say, that those words would be given to you at that proper time, and that is what we have from Paul. The Apostle Paul points to to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus as the decisive event in history that changed everything, not only in his life, but in the life of every Jew and every Gentile for all mankind and for all time. So Paul begins his defense with his testimony as a loyal and faithful Jew. This is really important because this is the the foundation of Paul's testimony. He is a loyal and faithful Jew. He is adhering to the law, even according to the strictest party of their religion, the Pharisees. And Paul says that he is on trial because of his hope in the promise made by God to the fathers, verse 6. And then look at what he says in verse 8. He asks a question, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? And so I think we need to ask, why does Paul ask this question? He says this because all Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, and so to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead should not be an unthinkable act. Paul has pointed this out in his other defenses, uh, including in Acts 23 before the Jewish council. And let me read a couple verses there, verses 6 to 8. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope 
and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and this assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And so Paul is being wise as a serpent. He is being innocent as a dove. He is simply pointing out that he believes in the resurrection just like all Pharisees do. He is showing in his defense that he had not departed from the hope of Israel. If any one or any group had departed from the hope of Israel, it was the Sadducees that did not believe in the resurrection. Now back to Paul's defense before Agrippa. He does go on to say that like many of the Jewish leaders of his day, he did initially reject Jesus as the Messiah. Acts 26, 9, Paul says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul, like many other Jews, had missed the Messiah. Jesus had come to his own, but his own did not receive him, John 1, 11. Therefore, Paul was zealous to stomp out this new sect, these heretics that claimed that Jesus was God in the flesh. He completely missed the fulfillment that occurred in the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. And so this became his mission, to persecute the followers of Jesus. As we know, his life was forever changed on that Damascus road when Jesus himself, himself confronted Paul and set the record straight. And so we have that in our text today in verses 13 to 18. You can put the slide up there. You can look at that again if the, if the slides are working. Uh, this is the third account in Luke's letter of Paul's conversion and commission. There are similarities to other uh, accounts, and there are also some differences. In all three, we have record of the words from heaven, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And in all three, the response uh, to Paul's question of identity is the same. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, an added detail found in our passage, not found elsewhere, is where Paul recalls a further statement by Jesus, which is, it is hard to kick against the goads. And so this is a proverbial statement that implies futility. And it, with regard to God, it would, it would imply futility in resisting God's will or one's destiny. And so for an ox... To kick against a goad was to kick against a sharp point of a stick used to prod the beast forward. And so to kick against that would cause more harm to the beast. And so in this way, to rebel against the leading or prodding of God would cause even more harm. And so there's some debate among Christians as to what exactly this refers to in Paul's life. Was Paul resisting God's will and therefore kicking against and prodding the leading and, the, sorry, kicking against the prodding and leading of God in his life? Or was he resisting his own conscience as he tried to suppress the memories of those that he had persecuted and killed like Stephen, the first Christian martyr, who spoke convincingly of Jesus as the Messiah. And so again, we are not told exactly what this reference is referencing to, but both of these are possibilities that we should consider. They can both be true. <clears throat> the other difference between this account and others is that there is no mention of Ananias, who was sent by God to restore Paul and and set him as an apostle. In this account, in Acts 26, Paul focuses more on his commission to apostleship directly from Christ, who appointed him as a servant and a witness 
to open eyes, turning men and women away from darkness and lies to light and truth and forgiveness. And so there is connection to the call of previous prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah throughout uh, this commissioning of the Apostle Paul. For example, Paul is told to stand upon his feet. This is similar to the words that God gave to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 2, 1 to 3, and he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the spirit entered into me and set me on my feet and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. Also, Paul is told that he will be delivered from both his own people and the Gentiles. This is similar to Jeremiah's call. Jeremiah 1.8, God said to him, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Paul is then told that he will go and open eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. Again, we find similar language in the writings of the prophets. Uh, Isaiah 49.6, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Again, a connection to Acts 1.8. And then Isaiah 42.16, and I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. And so all this to say that Paul is operating in a long line of of prophets and apostles set apart by God as servants and witnesses of God, redeeming and reconciling mankind through faith in Christ. And so this brings us to Paul's conclusion, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the regions of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And so again, Paul has defended himself as a loyal and faithful Jew. Following the law and the teachings of the prophets and Moses, he concludes his defense with insisting that he was not disobedient to God's call on his life, but rather he stands before God and men with a clear conscience who has simply followed what the prophets and Moses prophesied about what would someday take place. And what Paul is insisting is that what Moses prophesied had now been fulfilled and was being fulfilled in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus the Messiah and through his continued ministry through the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so for us today, we simply continue the work of the early church proclaiming that Christianity is not a diversion from Judaism or the Old Testament, but rather it is the culmination, it is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament scriptures we're pointing to. And so in terms of application, <clears throat> I was really struggling with what, how to bring this home for us this morning. But I wonder if you have heard 
a teaching within Christianity over the past decade or so, <clears throat> or maybe longer, urging us as Christians to unhitch ourselves and our faith from the Old Testament. You may have heard that. You may, have know, you may know where that comes from. If you don't, that's fine. But the teaching seems to imply that we should, we should identify ourselves as New Testament Christians. Has anyone ever heard that term, I'm a New Testament Christian? Okay. <clears throat> and I would say that we should question that a little bit. We should challenge that. Uh, if someone were to come to me and say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian, I would think, well, you're, you, you're, it seems to be that you're implying that you're not an Old Testament Christian. And so you're, you must be a New Testament Christian, and, and good for you, but what does that mean? Uh, and so I think we should consider that. I think we should ponder that a little bit, uh, especially when we think of Paul's testimony here. Did Paul unhitch himself or his faith from the Old Testament here? And the answer is no. Did Peter shy away from the Old Testament when he proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah? Absolutely not. He pointed again and again to what had been proclaimed about the coming Messiah and then connecting those promises to Christ. You can look in Acts chapter 2 of Peter's first sermon, quoting again and again Old Testament scriptures and finding the fulfillment in Christ. Therefore, we don't dismiss the Old Testament as outdated or abolished. How many people say, well, yeah, that Old Testament, I just don't even read that because it's just, there's so much ugly stuff there. And I would caution you not to go down that road, but rather we should help one another to see that if we follow what is laid out in the Old Testament, we will find our ultimate destination in Jesus Christ, the risen and promised Savior. All of the scriptures were and are pointing ultimately to the person and work of the Messiah who is Jesus Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Look again here at what Paul focused on with regard to what the prophets and Moses would, said what would come to pass in verse 23, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. He's saying this is what we find in the Old Testament, in the prophets and in Moses. He must suffer. We find this in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, that he must be the first to rise from the dead. We find this in Psalm 1610, again Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, and that he would proclaim light to the nations. We find this in many places. Let me give you a couple, Isaiah 42, 6 and Isaiah 49, 6. And then lastly, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 24, and then we'll begin to wrap up here. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24 is, we pick up the story after the resurrection of Christ, after he has walked on the Emmaus road, and then now he has appeared to his disciples. He has calmed their fears. He has allowed them to touch his hands and his side. He has asked for food, uh, and he has e eaten with them. And then listen to his words in Luke 24, verses 44 to 40, 49. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written. And let's look at these three things that Jesus says. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Isn't that a perfect summary of our passage today? And it is a perfect summary of the whole book of Acts. All the scriptures do what? They point to Jesus. The scriptures teach what? The, the, the scriptures teach that Christ must do what? He must suffer, he must rise, and he must bring light and salvation, the forgiveness of sins. And then lastly, what are the disciples to do? They were to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, to be clothed with power from on high, and set apart as servants and witnesses of Christ, our Lord and King. And so this is the legacy of the Apostle Paul and, the, and of Peter and of the early church. Christ enthroned and the church empowered to go and make disciples, to open eyes, to proclaim light over darkness, to rescue men and women from the kingdom of Satan and bring them into the kingdom of God, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded. These are the ramifications of the resurrection. It all centers on Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Paul had a heart as he shared his defense that Agrippa would come to, be, to become a Christian. That, that very hour, that very moment, that was his heart. He was not just trying to be set free but hoping that Agrippa and all that heard would be set free as well. And so that, may that be our prayer as we continue to go and share the good news of Christ to those around us. I invite you to stand. I'd like to give you a, a closing blessing and charge. So please stand with me and let me read from Colossians 1, 9 to 14. And just make this a prayer as, as we read, as I read. And so from the day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved 